Dr. Wallander, it's a pleasure to have you here at UNC Chapel Hill. Thank you very much for your talk to the Krasno event series. It was about Putin, about Russian politics, about Russian-American relations. And as you know, a lot of people in the media talk about a new Cold War with Russia. That is, of course, frightening and threatening. My question to you, is really what we are seeing now, can we call that a new Cold War? And Do you think there is room for re-engagement with Russia? I think... I, I don't like the frame, a new Cold War, because I think it makes people think that we're back where we were in the 20th century. And while U.S.-Russia relations are very seriously in a, in a bad place, uh, and I believe that the uh, Russian leadership uh, it has a, a view of the United States that is very negative and very problematic and is actively seeking to weaken the United States, undermine our relationships, and erode our global leadership, um, I think it, we need to understand that this is the 21st century and there's a different reason for the negative nature of our relationship, which is rooted in the form of uh, political economic power within Russia, the, what scholars have called Putinism, and that the Putin leadership has come to see everything that is important to American national interests. Uh, international competition in the economic sphere, uh, free and fair elections, uh, accountability, transparency, investor rights, uh, the international rules-based order, to see that as a threat to its own rule inside. And so has identified the United States um, through merely the exercise of our own national interests to be a threat to Russia internally. So I, I think it's a slightly different reason for the negative, well, more than slightly different reason for the negative relationship, and therefore the solution is a little bit different. Um, I do think that there is room where the United States and Russia have some overlapping interests, such as um, nu nuclear nonproliferation, uh, strategic arms control, hopefully managing climate change in the Arctic and the effects of climate change in the Arctic. There are areas where we could um, exercise our responsible global leadership, uh, but, but it's not the sort of fundamental positive relationship that we'd hoped for at the end of the Cold War. So is cooperation actually continuing at the so-called working level away from the top leaders in both countries? Um, for the most part, not, and it hasn't since 2012, even before uh, the Ukrainian crisis. I mean, the reset uh, was sort of very publicly over with the Russian invasion of Crimea and the Donbass, but it had already eroded when President Putin came back to power because of this uh, threat assessment, which saw uh, U.S. programs, Uf U.S. efforts to engage Russia as, uh, instead of being positive for Russia, as somehow undermining the Russian leadership. So a lot of the constructive programs that uh, the Obama administration had advanced during the reset uh, from 2009 uh, to, to 2012 had already kind of ground to, ground to a halt because when President Putin came back, uh, the leadership had different priorities and a different attitude mm -hmm. towards uh, the international community. Mm -hmm. Are we not at least partially overrating Russia? Because the economy is weak, uh, Russia is totally dependent on oil and gas exports. It's not really what we would call large industrial productive uh, uh, companies. There's no Russian Apple or no Russian Microsoft as far as I know. So are we not simply overrating the power of the country? Russia is perhaps not as powerful uh, as China in the long run because its economy, as you suggest, is being mismanaged. Um, the leadership is, rather than investing in innovation, competition, in creating a positive business climate for both Russian investors and foreign investors, it's actually driving them away through its political activities. And so while the Russian economy is on a slow, uh, declining uh, trajectory in other countries, uh, in, uh, in the global south, India um, and certainly China, are, have already overtaken the Russian economy and, and are succeeding much, at a much greater pace, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of Russia's military capabilities, strategic nuclear capabilities, and conventional capabilities. Uh, its cyber capabilities, which it uses to interfere uh, and put other countries on kind of the defensive and, and is a source of weakness in democracies because of the manipulation of our domestic politics, not just our elections, but the whole uh, narratives of extremism and uh, you know far right and far left 
antagonism is fueled by this Russian capability, the significant capability. So while we should, you're right, we shouldn't see Russia as, you know, sort of 10 feet tall, and over time, uh, the economy is not going to be able to sustain the kind of global power that the uh, leadership has uh, aspirations for, we also shouldn't underestimate that in the near term to the medium term, Rus Russia is a strategic competitor mm -hmm. to the United States with significant capabilities. Thank you. How important is Putin as a person? When we look at China and Xi Jinping, you would say Xi Jinping is important, but even without Xi Jinping, China would still be strong and would still be rising. If you look at Rus uh, Russia and think uh, Russia without Putin, we may be talking about a different country. What do you mm -hmm. think? One of the reasons I refer to the scholarly term Putinism as opposed to Putin is to highlight that while Putinism may have been may have been rooted in Putin's personality, his experience, his influence, his background in St. Petersburg, uh, his background in the uh, Soviet security services, Putinism is now more than just Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot of debate and speculation about what will happen in 2024 when his current term is over. And will there be a different, different successor? Will someone challenge him for the position? Um, Putinism without Putin still, I think, will look much like it looks now. If you still have that kind of political power rooted in control of the economy, uh, corrupt business practices, and the reinforcement of uh, those, that corruption on political power, the same basic dynamics, I think, would uh, persist even without Putin. Other leaders in Russia might not be as good at it as he. Other leaders may not have the public persona Uh, and the ability to sustain the system, but I do think it's a danger to think that this is all about Putin. It now kind of is, it's more than Putin, mm -hmm. in the same way that Stalinism actually um, continued after you know, Stalin was uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Soviet leader. So we shouldn't necessarily personalize our analysis of Russian politics too much. Much of the tension with Russia between the West and Russia came about with the 2014 invasion of eastern Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. Mm -hmm. Can we assume, being realistic, that Crimea is really lost for good and that perhaps there is some room for a compromise agreement regarding eastern Ukraine? Or is that too, either too optimistic or too pessimistic? So I think a compromise <laughs> agreement on eastern Ukraine, on the Donbass, is already on the table. Um, it's an imperfect agreement. It's the Minsk agreement from first 2014 and then a, a second Minsk version was updated in, in 2015. It's very imperfect, um, but it's what we have to work with. And one of the strengths of it is France and Germany are committed through the Normandy format to helping to implement it. And Ukraine now has a new leader who's very popular, uh, who has strong support in the Rada, who hopefully will find a way to sit down in the context of the Normandy format uh, and get President Putin to finally agree to a pragmatic and honorable implementation of that agreement that is consistent with Ukraine's uh, international standing and its sovereignty and ter territorial integrity. Crimea is more complicated, I think, um, because uh, there is no agreement on the table that, in theory, Russia has signed on to. And in fact, it is unilaterally sought to just declare the, the matter closed. So I, I think getting the Russian, this Russian leadership or maybe a successor Russian leadership to accept that it needs to sit down at the table with Ukraine with international mediation under international law, uh, which would be the goal to, to negotiate a resolution of that issue, that one's going to be a lot harder, I think, for the Russian leadership to concede that they were wrong. And there's something possible like that, that Crimea will not be lost? Um, you know, who would have, who would have thought that uh, the Berlin Wall would come down uh, <laughs> and that uh, the Soviet Union would crumble? So I think we shouldn't ever exclude anything in history, but I do think it's complicated and it, in, uh, I don't predict it uh, occurring anytime soon, unfortunately. Russia has now also become or become again a Middle Eastern power with the involvement in Syria. Mm -hmm. And we talk much about a new emerging global order. China is mentioned, the United States, of course, Europe, India, and a few other countries. 
if you look into the future, 10, 20 years from now, will Russia be part of that emerging global order or will it really be a secondary power, maybe overshadowed by its close alliance with China? Well, ch Chinese economy is, has slowed down, but it continues to grow at a pace that far outstrips uh, Russia. And so I think that China will continue to rise. And it, as its economy, uh, as leadership continues to build on its economic and business resources and assets, political power and military power, I think the balance of power between China and Russia will shift over time. Uh, it'll shift subtly, maybe in a decade, maybe longer. Um, but certainly the balance of that relationship is going to tilt to the advantage of China if current, if current trends continue. Um, I think Russia will always have be able to throw its weight around um, because of its nuclear weapons, uh, because of its seat on the UN Security Council. Now, if there's periodically there are discussions about reforming the UN and the UN Security Council because the UN Security Council right now reflects basically the world in 1945 not the world in the 21st century. You have other rising powers. Uh, it doesn't make sense to, to have you know, France and the UK as, the, as European members of the Security Council when Europe as a whole has you know, the kind of influence and power it does. So there's all kinds of discussions and proposals and ideas for UN uh, reform. If those were to succeed, I think you would see a change in Russia's ability to use its influence and its position. And that's one of the reasons why Russia has opposed uh, some of these ideas for reform. But I think the pressure to change some of the multilateral institutions to better reflect 21st century realities is something that Russia is going to have a hard time resisting, not least because China is interested in reform of some of these institutions. And I think that will be a hard thing for Russia to block mm -hmm. over time. Final question on American-Russian relations and, of course, the closeness of President Trump and President Putin. Will that make a difference that the leading personalities, for whatever reason, that the leading personalities seem to like each other, seem to like to work and talk to each other, or is that really not all that relevant when it comes to the nitty-gritty? Well, I think you've seen that the fact that President Putin and President Trump say nice things about another and seem to like one another hasn't led to a change in U.S.-Russia relations. And the reason for that is back to what I laid out, which is I think that this Russian leadership um, defines its interests and has a concept of threat assessment that is antithetical to an international system and an American set of American priorities that are really important for America. So I don't, I don't think it goes to the point of being zero sum, as we talked about during the Cold War, but there is considerable conflict, uh, conflicting interests and priorities and objectives and understanding of what's necessary between Russia and the United States. And in the end, President Trump can have his own personal view of President Putin, but President Trump is the president of a democratic country, and he represents the whole country. And, he ha and in the end, what we've seen is that um, nice things can be said, but what really matters in American foreign policy are the interests of the American people. And I think that that's going to, um, that is reassuring for me as an American, um, but it's problematic for President Putin because it's not just about being friends with President Trump. It's about addressing American national security interests as well. Thank you very much. Celeste Wallander, thank you very much for your insights and for coming to UNC Chapel Hill. Much thank appreciated. You. Thank you very much for the opportunity.